I hope you are fine. We will we will start our talk uh, in just a few. Just keep on adm admitting uh, some of the participants, and then we start off. Okay. Uh, this link uh, you sent me is shareable? Yes. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, greetings from Nature Kenya. It's quite a sunny afternoon here in uh, Nairobi. My name is Richard Kipngeno, uh, the Boarding and Membership Officer of Nature Kenya, and uh, I will be the one moderating this uh, talk for today. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome each and every one of you to our today's uh, members virtual talk entitled uh, Pesticides Use and Emerging Economies. What does data say? Uh, this talk will be presented by Dr. Victor Shikuku, who will uh, land on the floor in a very short while. Uh, maybe just to let you know uh, is that uh, this uh, uh, talk is uh, recorded and we will be able to upload uh, after we are done in our Nature Kenya YouTube channel. So you can always uh, revisit later. And also to let you know that we are live in our uh, Nature Kenya Facebook page. So I will request each and every one of you to remain muted so that we give uh, the presenter an ample time. And uh, should you maybe have any question, any compliment or any concern as the presentation is going on, you can always uh, drop them in the chat box. So uh, that's just a few uh, comments before we start the presentation. And um, just a quick uh, bio of our uh, today's uh, presenter about uh, Dr. Victor Shikuku. He holds a PhD in chemistry from Maseno University and postdoctoral research experience at Trier University in Germany. His research interest is in the fate of xenobiotics in the environment as soil, water, and food and remediation techniques. He has published more than 20 peer-reviewed journal papers, more than 10 book chapters in university level textbooks, and is an editor of a university textbook on emerging contaminants in water resources. Currently, Dr. Victor is a lecturer in the Department of Physical Sciences at Kaimosi Friends University College here in Kenya, where he holds other administrative positions and is the head of the laboratory at CSI International Limited, an accredited industrial testing laboratory in Nairobi. He is as well a consultant on environmental health and safety related work. Uh, so that is just a quick uh, a brief view of our today's presenter's bio. And uh, without wasting my time, let's give him a chance to take us through this very informative and interactive talk for today. Welcome, Dr. Shikuku. Uh, thank you. Uh, from Kenya, it is afternoon hours. So I will say good afternoon. Uh, I hope all is well, everyone is well. Welcome to this uh, brief uh, conversation, a brief conversation on uh, pesticides used in emerging economies. I wish to make preliminary statements. Of course, you already have my, my bio. Uh, I wish to just go straight to the discussion we have, then probably we can engage from the chat platform uh, on uh, this very important subject. Uh, the question of uh, pesticides is a very serious conversation. And uh, maybe in emerging economies, it has not gained momentum as such. But uh, in the West and uh, what we may call the developed countries, uh, this is a very important uh, uh, subject. I will begin by appreciating the fact that I know that uh, 
the, my audience is a mixed audience and uh, there could be different interest groups. Probably they are uh, uh, ecotoxicologists who may be interested in things pertaining to toxicology of pesticides. There could be environmentalists present who are uh, interested in um, the fate of pesticides in the environment, soil, uh, water, air, and so forth. Uh, there could be individuals here who are uh, uh, food, health, and security experts. They may be interested on the questions pertaining the safety of food uh, grown using pesticides. They may be interested on questions about organic farming and whether even organic farming is sustainable to meet the food demands of a country and things like that. Maybe there could be also policy makers and enforcers and regulators present in the audience. The business community, those who may be in the business of manufacturing pesticides, retail and selling. And so they become very interested in, in uh, such kind of conversations. There could be medical health, uh, health experts. Uh, and of course, all of us are food consumers which means that even if you don't fall in any of the other categories, at least uh, the fact that we are all food consumers, this subject should be important to us. And maybe others are just here out of curiosity uh, to just know what, what is going on and so forth. And so all these interest groups have different interests, different questions uh, that may, they may have. And of course, I will begin by admitting that I don't have all the answers to those questions because uh, as you can see that uh, those are very diverse disciplines and some questions may need uh, uh, experts in those particular fields to adequately uh, respond to them. So the fact that we have a, a mixed audience means that uh, a conversation like this one cannot be uh, merely a technical uh, conversation, because if we go technical, then uh, some people may miss out uh, uh, on the value of this particular uh, conversation. So what I will do today is I will be provoking our thoughts into this important question of uh, the use of pesticides, particularly uh, in uh, emerging economies like uh, Kenya or in Africa in a general sense. So these different interest groups emerge because they all come from uh, the different uh, steps in the life cycle of uh, pesticides. And so from the time the pesticides are manufactured and then uh, they are brought into the market and then we have the farmers using them, then we have the food production, we have uh, the pesticides going to the soil and water, the pesticides interacting with living organisms in the environment. Uh, then we have the food consumers on the other side. Uh, then we have the regulators. So all of us will find ourselves somewhere along the chain or in the life cycle of the pesticides. So depending on where you find yourself, that informs the kind of questions which will be of interest um, to, to, to you. So sometimes the, the interest of the manufacturer may not necessarily align with the interest of the food consumer or maybe even the regulators and so forth. But the question is then, uh, because we come from different, different uh, fields, uh, fields, uh, fields uh, I'm having echoes, having echoes, having echoes, having echoes. Uh, Dr. Victor, kindly unmute so that we are able to hear you. Okay, is that okay? Yes, that's fine. So because we come uh, in at different steps in the life cycle of the pesticides, that informs the kind of questions that uh, we may pose as far as uh, the use of pesticides uh, is concerned. And of course, this is a very emotive subject, particularly in the uh, developed countries. But uh, it is important that uh, in as much as the subject is emotive and hot, uh, 
it is important that we approach it uh, with the right attitude. Because, for example, the manufacturer and the retail will be interested in and look at, looking at the questions like you are against my business, for example, if you are appealing that certain chemicals should be withdrawn from the market. Uh, there are those who will be looking at uh, these questions with different attitudes, for example. And in my assessment, I generally say that we approach any subject, and in this context, the question of pesticides, with at least three kinds of attitudes. The first attitude is what I would call a believer's attitude. And by a believer's attitude, I mean uh, these are people who will take a given report wholesomely and uh, run with it and uh, close their ears to the questions that may be asked concerning a given position, whether you are advocating for the use of chemical pesticides or you are against the use of chemical pesticides, one may approach the subject with the attitude of a believer with, of your position and you hold it and you close your ears to whatever questions that may be. Another possible attitude is that is which I may call of a skeptic, which means that the skeptic dismisses the report regardless of the weight of the evidence that the report uh, may contain. And so while the believer accepts the report and does not want to listen to the questions, the, the skeptic uh, dismisses the report without interrogating the, the, the weight of the evidence or the merit of the report. And then the last attitude that we may have is that of which I may call an inquirer. And the inquirer will hold verdict until the end of the report and he makes a decision based on the weight of the evidence. And so sometimes we may have these attitudes without really knowing that uh, we have those particular biases. And so as we go into this discussion, I will uh, implore all of us that we will have the inquirer's attitude, whereby we will hold our verdicts until the end of a given report, then we can make judgments uh, depending on uh, the weight of the evidence. And that means that uh, the inquirer at the end of the day will make a decision even if all the questions have not been answered because one thing is true is that questions will always remain. Uh, if we talk about the entire body of knowledge that exists, we know very little compared to what we should know and again, what we do not know is much more than what we know. And so that does not stop us from uh, uh, making decisions in, in spite of uh, our limited knowledge. And so if we have an inquirer's attitude, then we can look at the weight of the evidence and make a decision even if some questions remain unanswered. Now let's talk about pesticides and we begin by definition of terms. Now we know we, when we talk about pesticides, somebody may talk about herbicides, uh, acaricides, and uh, in terms of uh, criminology, we can even talk about homicide. And so all these terminologies have something in common. They have a common suffix, which is the side. And so when you talk about pesticides, what does the, the suffix side mean? The suffix side simply means a killer or the act of killing, to kill or to strike down. And therefore pesticides, by their very definition, they are agents of death. And of course, when we talk about pesticides being agents of death, they are killer tools then uh, the question is then who is the target? Is this death deliberate, intentional, or these can be even tools of an intentional harm and even death. But what is coming out in this, what I want us to understand from the word go is that pesticides by their very definition, 
they are agents or tools of death. They will be used to kill and to strike down. Of course, that raises a question because when you talk about agents of killing, of course, we know that we are uh, going in the realm of chemical weapons. And so are we really saying that pesticides are chemical weapons? And in this presentation, I will argue that yes, indeed, that uh, as their names suggest, that pesticides are indeed chemical weapons. But of course, when you talk about chemical weapons, immediately there's something, there's, the thing that comes to our mind is uh, uh, bombs and military warfare, because that is the traditional and conventional uh, uh, understanding of chemical weapons. And somebody may say that saying that pesticides are chemical weapons, that sounds like being a sensationalist and uh, uh, creating uh, unnecessary alarm. But uh, do pesticides really uh, fall? Can they be rightfully defined as chemical weapons? Now, OPCW gives the following definition of a chemical weapon. This is derived directly uh, from their website. They say, quote, a chemical weapon is a chemical used to cause intentional death or harm through its toxic properties. So you can notice that according to that definition of a chemical weapon, the definition of a chemical weapon does not depend on what is being killed, but by the definition is neutral in the sense that a chemical weapon is any chemical that is used to cause intentional death or harm through its toxic properties. And so if pesticides by definition cause death and harm, to some organisms or even maybe humans as we shall see, then they fit squarely in the definition of chemical weapon. And so a chemical weapon should not be necessarily understood as that chemical that could be used to cause intentional death or harm to human beings only. In fact, OPCW, they continue to say, a common conception of a chemical weapon is of a toxic chemical contained in a delivery system such as a bomb or artillery shell. While technically correct, a definition based on this conception would only cover a small portion of a range of things the Chemical Weapons Convention prohibits as chemical weapons. In other words, if your understanding of a chemical weapon is a toxic chemical contained in something like a chemical bomb, while that will be technically correct, that definition is limited and restricting. And there is a, bow, a whole spectrum of chemicals that will be classified as a chemical weapon, but may not fit in that particular definition. And so looking at this definition of a chemical weapon, we can rightfully say, that actually pesticides are chemical weapons. But somebody will pose the question, fine that pesticides are chemical weapons, truly they are. They cause intentional death and harm because, through their toxic properties. But is there a difference really between pesticides and a bomb, for example? And of course, I know we may say that, uh, yeah, there is a fundamental difference between pesticides and bombs and warfare, uh, the chemicals used in warfare. And uh, the question will be, what is the difference really? Maybe we will say pesticides are used to eliminate organisms that are uh, disturbing to us as humans, okay? control some disease and pests, for example. And then maybe the bombs and the uh, military warfare will say they are used to eliminate human beings who may be a problem to us. And they may be acting in a pest-like manner, so to speak, for lack of a better word. But if that is the difference that maybe the uh, Military warfare are particularly chemical weapons 
geared towards fellow human beings, while uh, pesticides are chemical warfare, which have human beings as non-target. And so you can target the weeds and the pests and so forth. If that is the difference, then the question is, what is the similarity? And I want to argue uh, this afternoon that actually that is not really a difference, but it is still actually a similarity. In other words, somebody is asking, are you saying that bombs and military warfare can be used to eliminate uh, food crops uh, and you bomb uh, farms and so forth? And uh, I will say that uh, the answer is yes. We have a contemporary example in our time. For example, as we speak, we have the crisis in uh, Ukraine and the reports being published uh, in the media, for example, this one notes that Russia attacks on farms and silos deliberately trying to destroy the Ukrainian economy. In other words, we are using chemical weapons in, in the form of military warfare, not only for the destruction of human life, but also uh, food stores and farms and so forth. And therefore, you can see that these chemical weapons, which are military based, can still be used, so to speak, to cause death and harm to even uh, food materials, so to speak. Uh, another one quickly, another news outlet. Uh, this one is from the Bloomberg, it reiterates the same point. Warhouse bombed. Tractors stolen as Russia strikes Ukraine food. So just as we may use pesticides as chemical weapons in agriculture, and we apply them to food materials, we are noticing here that we can also use chemical weapons in the in the warfare uh, or in the military circles and apply them on uh, farm yards and uh, on food uh, materials as well. So the perceived difference between pesticides and bombs is only philosophical, but in practical sense, they have commonalities and we can see this outplaying uh, when we have this type of uh, crisis. But the, that is not the only similarity. When we use bombs, uh, which we agree are chemical weapons, the question is, do we have what we may call collateral damage when we use these types of chemical weapons? Now, somebody will ask, what is a collateral damage? By definition, collateral damage is unintended damage, injuries, or death caused by an action, especially unintended civilian casualties caused by a military operation. And of course, examples of collateral damage will be destruction of untargeted buildings, land, ETC, uh, or even civilians. These are uh, sorts of what we may call collateral damage as far as chemical weapons in military operations are concerned. And so you can see, for example, in that picture, yes, you will want to eliminate people perceived to be the enemies, but in the process, you will destroy buildings, you will destroy uh, civilians who are non target and so forth. That is a characteristic of these types of uh, chemical weapons. But the question now is, when we look at pesticides as chemical weapons, is it possible that the use of pesticides also come along with collateral damage? And so that we will have unintended damage and injuries, even death through the use of pesticide. And we will notice that at the end of this presentation that this is true. And so in that sense, the perceived difference between pesticides and bombs is only a perception. But in terms of practical reality, these forms of chemical weapons are the same. They have the same uh, kind of baggage not only causing damage and death to the intended life forms, but they also uh, have an intended damage, injuries and death, which you may call collateral damage. 
Of course, when a farmer is using pesticides, he does not have human beings as part of the intended uh, target of damage and death. He has the pests and the weeds and so forth. But now, if we look at this subject in the big picture, then we notice that uh, the subject becomes broader than just the control of uh, pests and uh, hub, uh, uh, weeds, for example. So my argument this afternoon is that herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and all these forms of pesticides, they form the same category as all these articles of warfare. They may have different applications, so to speak, from the manufacturer's point of view, but they all have the same similarities and uh, the differences, I am arguing, are only imaginary. The same way we have just seen that even these articles of warfare can be used to destroy food sources and um, bomb farmland and come with collateral damage. I am arguing that also these pesticides are chemical weapons that have the same uh, kind of attributes. It is for this reason that uh, pesticides having been identified as chemical weapons with collateral damage, that is why many of the European countries, which are the West, the developed countries, they are coming to the conclusion that some of these pesticides we can live without them. Because of their collateral damage, they are going forward to ban uh, the use of certain uh, chemicals. For example, in this news here, the European Union, uh, the European Union top court on Thursday, uh, this is uh, last year, upheld the EU's partial ban on three insecticides linked to harming bees, preventing their use on certain crops. The European Court of Justice dismissed an appeal by the manufacturer that is Bayer to overturn a lower EU court's 2018 decision to uphold the ban. The ruling covers three active substances, imidacloropid, developed by Bayer, uh, chlorpyridimine, that is a de uh, developed by uh, Takeda, and then we also have uh, the last chemical there, thiamethoxam, which is also manufactured uh, by Bayer Crop Science. What this is simply saying is that the recognition of pesticides as chemical weapons with potential collateral damage, both to human beings and uh, to other living things in the ecosystem like bees have led some of these countries in the West to outlaw and to ban and to prohibit the manufacture and the sale of certain pesticides in their jurisdiction. Of course, uh, unfortunately, while these countries in the West are taking such positions concerning, concerning certain pesticides, the contradiction is this, for example, this uh, news outlet points out that data obtained by an act, that is the NGO, the investigative arm of Greenpeace and Swiss NGO Public Eye shows that 3,900 tons of banned neonicotinoid pesticides were destined to leave the EU and UK for low and middle income nations with the weaker environmental regulations in three months after the ban came into force. In other words, what is coming out is, these countries in the West, by recognizing the collateral damage that comes with the use of certain pesticides and chemical ingredients, they outlaw and ban the use of those chemicals in their jurisdiction. But at the same time, these countries uh, or these companies are exporting tons of these banned pesticides to low and middle income countries, well knowing that these developing or emerging economies, 
they do not have robust systems to use such toxic chemicals. In fact, the paradox is this. If Western countries, which have developed systems for more judicial use of pesticides, how is it that they are convinced that emerging economies and low-income countries that do not have this infrastructure in place that these particular countries are suited to be the consumers and the users of these banned pesticides. Of course, this is not a legal issue. It's not a legal issue because these countries like Kenya have not banned some of those pesticides. And so the question I am posing here is not a legal question. Maybe I could say it could be one of uh, a moral question. In other words, if I do not smoke because of the abundant evidence of the health, uh, the, the problems that comes with smoking, is it morally right for me then to sell those cigarettes and destroy the life of other people? And so it is not necessarily a legal question, but I will say it also has a moral implication. Maybe I can put it this way. Of course, we have learned over the years uh, the common statement that one man's meat is a man, another man's poison. But I will see, it seems to me that in terms of banned toxic pesticide, one man's poison is another man's meat. In other words, to the European countries, these chemicals are toxic poisoners, they should be banned. But in their minds, it seems as though they should be meat for the low income and middle income economies. And of course, our regulators have not banned these pesticides. And of course, they are being brought in the country legally. And so sometimes then we may pose the question to whose interest are the regulators acting? And uh, it is assumed that the regulators should be acting to the best interest of the nations that they represent. And so if it is in our context, Kenya, we have uh, entrusted our well-being to uh, PCPB, for example, to parliament and all these organs. And the common Monainchi anticipates that his well-being should be guarded jealously by these particular uh, organs of our country. And so what we are saying here is the data shows that uh, particular ingredients have been banned in the West. In those countries is where those particular chemicals are manufactured. And then they are shipped all the way to low income countries that have not outlawed those particular chemicals. They do not have the state of art uh, infrastructure for a judicial and safe use of those particular chemicals. And so is it possible that maybe we are importing chemical weapons that will do much damage to our people uh, while uh, other people elsewhere are not using them against their own population? Of course, research on pesticides in Africa has been going on for quite a while by now. And uh, if we want to look at uh, what our scientists have been doing over the years, we will say that there is sufficient data. It is not enough, we can I agree. Uh, of course, we do not have enough funding to do some of the research that the scientists in Africa may want to do. They may not have um, adequate scientific infrastructure to do state-of-the-art research uh, as far as pesticides is concerned. But the data that we have so far is also sufficient for us to ask important questions and to draw meaningful uh, conclusions. And uh, the, the studies that have been done in Africa as far as the occurrence of pesticides in environmental matrices, that is soil, uh, water, biota, and uh, in biological samples, for example, in human hair, in uh, uh, human liquid samples, like for example, in human blood or in uh, breast milk, we have sufficient, 
not sufficient, but we can say um, data that is uh, plausible enough for us to make meaningful conclusion. For example, the, what you have in the screen now is a, a, a review of data that has been published within the African context for the last 20 years as far as the occurrence of uh, organopesticide uh, residues in both biological and environmental uh, matrices are concerned. And uh, of course, the results tell us different things. Number one, for example, as far as organochloride pesticides is concerned, some of the things that we come out is that, for example, at present, we can safely say that Tanzania is, is considered the most polluted due to the accumulation of organopesticide, uh, organochloride pesticides, uh, resulting from the illegal dumping and storage of obsolete pesticides since 1986. Of course, other countries may be worse. We may not know, but according to published data that we have, if we may compare the countries in Africa, the data suggests that uh, Tanzania will be the most polluted as far as this class of pesticides are concerned. As far as other classes of pesticides, the story might be different. And uh, we are saying that, that also the story might be even worse in other countries, only the difference might be there may be no sufficient data published from that country for one reason or the other that we have mentioned. Uh, number two, we also noticed that several African countries lack information on the occurrence of these contaminants in the environment. In fact, there is a huge gap uh, between the scientists and researchers and uh, uh, the laity or the common person in the streets. And most of the times the scientists do their research work, they publish their work in the research journal, they write their thesis and the story ends there. But I think it is time that scientists should politicize their research findings. They shall, should come out in the political space, in the social arena, in, in the, uh, the media, so that uh, they can communicate in the language of the common people their research findings. Because you see, if you publish your research in the, in the, in the journal, the common person in the street who buys the food from where you sampled your samples will not read the journal articles, does not have the technical exp expertise to interpret your research findings. If we start talking about here, the concentrations in micrograms per gram or in PPB, you'll be talking to a very small uh, audience. And so it is important that uh, the scientists should not be satisfied by simply publishing their research findings in research journals, but they should come to the public sphere and educate the, the people and the policymakers concerning uh, their research findings as well. And it is found that in Africa and emerging economies, uh, we are lagging behind as far as communicating research finding to inform the common man and to inform public policy uh, as well. Uh, another striking feature about pesticides in Africa is that most of these studies have been restricted to the analysis of pesticides in fish. When you're talking about biological occurrence of pesticides in biological uh, matrices. And most of these studies focus in fish, but uh, data shows that Africans don't just eat fish, but we also uh, consume seafood. We eat crabs, mussels, and all shrimps, and all these seafood that uh, uh, constitute part of our, the diet in Africa. And so if we, uh, most of the studies have been restricted to, to fish, it means that uh, the biological accumulation or the occurrence of pesticides in these other seafoods that we consume remains largely unknown. And the risk therefore also remains unknown. Furthermore, when we talk about the occurrence of pesticides in food and in fish, sometimes you'll realize that most of these studies may conclude that the concentration of the pesticides in a given food sample is below uh, the allowable 
um, limits, and therefore the conclusion is that the food is safe. But I think it is important also that we look at uh, how valid some of these conclusions will be. Of course, the conclusion will be valid in the sense that the concentration of a given pesticide in a given food sample may be within the acceptable limit, and therefore it is safe for consumption at that level. But you will also notice at the same time that you do not eat that food once in a lifetime. For example, if we talk about the occurrence of pesticides in tomatoes, you'll realize, for example, in the Kenyan context, it is more likely than not that any given Kenyan will consume tomato almost every single day, whether from between breakfast to supper, one of those meals will entail the consumption of tomatoes. And so that means your daily intake of tomatoes will be uh, pesticides through tomato will be quite high because you are eating tomatoes so much often. And so the amount of pesticide you will be uh, exposed to will be relatively much higher than just making the conclusion that because the concentration was less than the allowable limit, therefore the food is safe. Number two, the other problem that will emerge is most of the time we say that uh, the concentration of a given pesticide should be safe if it is below a given limit, which is fine. Uh, but these statements are based on a given single pesticide. But when you do pesticide analysis of a given food material, you do not report one pesticide. Most of the time, there are several pesticides present in a given food, even if the concentration is low. And so the question is, what is the effect of this pesticide on health when they are in a combination of several pesticides? Can we safely say that because the concentration of the pesticide is below a given limit, Therefore, it is safe even when those pesticides occur in a given combination of pesticides. Such a conclusion, I would argue, is not warranted. You cannot make a statement, a blanket statement based on one pesticide and say that this is how the pesticide will behave if you have, say, a combination of 10 pesticides. And so that means food safety is something that we cannot say today that truly our food is safe, given that we have a, a very intensive pesticide-based agriculture. The next point is that the data so far shows that there is limited data on the occurrence of pesticides in ambient air and tissues of animals and humans. Most of the studies that are done in the occurrence of pesticides in the environment, they base mostly in water samples and in soil samples and uh, in fish, for example, but very few studies in the African context will look at the occurrence of pesticides in air. And you can, of course, agree some of the application methods of pesticides will lead to these pesticides occurring in air, for example. We have very few studies on the occurrence of pesticides in the tissues of human beings. And uh, that tells us that we really do not know the magnitude of the problem specifically to the African people. Uh, of course, we have studies that have shown the occurrence of pesticides beyond acceptable limits in breast milk. Now you see, by the time you can detect pesticides in the breast milk of a lactating mother, and the concentrations are beyond acceptable limits. For example, this has been done in Ethiopia. In Kenya, I have tried to find out, and it seems to date, we do not have any studies on the occurrence of pesticides in breast milk in Kenya. The earliest I could get is dating back to early 90s. But any recent study on the occurrence of pesticides in breast milk in lactating mothers in Kenya, I could not find any. But of course, the examples of Ethiopia, they raise questions that by the time the pesticide concentration in breast milk exceeds allowable limits, of course, that 
present a problem to the child. And of course, we can talk about the immune system of the children and the risk to the children. It also tells about the risk factor on the mother herself by the time it has bioaccumulated until she presents a risk to her own child. And so what we are saying here is, there is great need for us to invest in research on the level of risk of um, our population to the use of this pesticide. Even particularly more to those pesticides that have been banned in the European countries, but they are still being imported uh, to our country. And of course, that's why I, begin by, I began by saying that these things, we must perceive them as chemical weapons. You see, the main difference I may say between a pesticide and uh, say a bomb in terms of a chemical weapon is that the bombs will uh, annihilate and destroy you instantly. But maybe the pesticides are a chemical weapon that are destroying us slowly but surely. But at the end of the day, it is still harmful and uh, causing death to our people. And so we cannot afford to be neutral uh, on these questions. We must ask these questions of course, with an inquirer's attitude, not with skepticism, or we wholeheartedly take the reports that uh, the people from the West or the scientists will be saying uh, without asking valid questions. Another thing that comes out is that most of the studies on these pesticides have been reported, particularly in Southern and Western Africa. And so you will find that, especially South Africa, you will find that probably it is because they are uh, endowed, uh, generally speaking, in terms of scientific infrastructure. And so they are able to uh, do most of these studies. And so there is very little data compared to other regions of Africa. But when you talk about the Sub-Saharan Africa, where Africa, Kenya will lie, we have very scanty data compared to what the people in Southern Africa and Western Africa, uh, what they are doing as far as this is concerned. And of course, it raises a question that uh, if that is the case and uh, Tanzania uh, will be quite active, for example, in performing, re doing research in this area, and their results show that they are the most polluted, then it raises the question about the other regions of Sub Saharan Africa, which have limited data on the use of pesticides and the occurrence in environmental and biological uh, samples. The other thing that comes out is that the main challenges facing pesticide usage in the African and emerging economies include inadequate enforcement of policies, that is to check the importation of these chemicals. Uh, and most of us uh, are never concerned especially sometimes the PCPD puts out a communication the, uh, for public participation on um, the ingredients that should be banned, that should be used with restriction, that should be legalized for free use. Most of the time, even the scientists in, in, uh, in Kenya do not uh, participate in, in this kind of processes. Um, these policies also have to do with levity in measures to stop their usage. They are those that have been banned, but sometimes you find that uh, a pesticide is banned in Kenya, but it has not been banned in Uganda, and our borders are porous, and uh, these chemicals still find their way, and our farmers will still be using these particular uh, chemicals. Uh, in proper pesticide handling by farmers, uh, we have studies and data that show that there are some pesticides that, yes, have been allowed in Kenya, but they have been allowed to be used for certain crops only. But those pesticides will be also be detected in other food crops where they should not be used, for example. And so improper handling of pesticides by farmers is also a particular problem that emerges when you look at the data that has been published in the African context. And then also we have non-existence of training programs on the use of pesticides. 
and there is very little being done, uh, especially the pesticides that are uh, today, they are, we can say, across the counter. The, the farmer will just buy the pesticide of interest uh, from the counter, and how the, the farmer will use the pesticide is uh, upon himself or herself. And therefore, it is important that uh, it is important that our farmers are also educated and trained uh, in the proper use uh, of these particular uh, chemicals. Uh, lastly, on this data uh, that uh, comes from the last 20 years of use of different pesticides, it, 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 in, it indicates that uh, pesticide occurrence in water resources and food samples is prevalent throughout Africa. And the problem here is not the occurrence of the pesticide residues. The problem here is we are so careful about the occurrence of pesticide in food only for food products for export. And therefore it suggests that the Africans are so careful that their food products are safe for the European and uh, the American or the market outside Africa. And we are careful that the pesticide residues are below the regulated limit. But when it comes to food production for the local market, then it is a free for all. And there is little concern concerning the occurrence of pesticides in food for the local market. And therefore it is important that the same concerns and the same rigor that we have towards food going for the external, the market outside Africa or outside our country, we should have the same vigilance concerning the food that we feed our own uh, population. Now, that is one concern concerning pesticides in food, in uh, liquid sam biological samples like breast milk, uh, importation of pesticides that have been banned, uh, exportation of safe food while we are eating food that we cannot guarantee its safety. Now, those are important concerns, but there are other concerns which are also important that we need to look at as a people. And you'll ask which other concerns? Now, from uh, we who are in Sub-Saharan Africa, malaria is one huge problem in Sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, the World Health Organization estimates that 229 million as the number of cases of malaria, and around four or 9,000 of those cases, they died of malaria having occurred, that is in 20, 2019. Of course, that is a huge population. But now the interesting part of this is, in the same year, that is 2019, 94% of all malaria deaths occurred in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, somebody will ask now, okay, now that is in itself a huge number, if Sub-Saharan Africa will account for 94% of malaria deaths in the world. The question will be, uh, what does this have to do with the use of pesticides for agricultural and food production? And uh, I want to argue this afternoon that maybe we are not solving the malaria problem because we are looking in the wrong direction. And we are looking at all these interventions like treated nets and so forth, which are also good and helpful in the control of malaria. But maybe the malaria problem we have in Sub-Saharan Africa maybe is coming from a different direction that we are not paying attention. And somebody will ask, which direction is this? Notice the problem we have in uh, concerning malaria in Kenya. For example, this paper will demonstrate that malaria vector insecticide resistance in different agroeconomic systems in Western Kenya. In other words, what the paper is showing is that the malaria vectors in Western Kenya are developing resistance towards the different insecticides that we use to control malaria. Of course, this is not just in Western Kenya. Uh, of course, 
Another paper from Western Kenya, this one also shows impact of insecticide resistance on that, those particular species of vectors, their effect on their biting, feeding, and resting behavior in selected clusters in Teso and South, uh, south sub counties in Busia County, Western Kenya. Again, this publication, a very recent one, I think this is 2020, it is also demonstrating once again that Western Kenya, which is one region that accounts to a great percent of malaria burden in Kenya, that the mosquitoes on this side and malaria vectors are developing insecticide resistance. And now managing malaria in these regions becomes a problem. But now the question is, from where could this problem of insecticide resistance coming from? And today you fall sick of malaria, you, you are ascribed some uh, antibiotics, and when you take them, they seem not to work. And so the malaria becomes a still a burden, and now we need new type of drugs to control malaria. Where is this problem coming from? The costs are not uh, excused. They are also part of the problem. This other publication, uh, this was published in 2021 last year. It demonstrates insecticide resistance status in the mosquitoes from the coastal region of Kenya. And now we are asking the question, how is it now that all of a sudden that the mosquito vectors in Western Kenya in the coast are developing insecticide resistance and now we have to have new types of drugs and intervention measures to control malaria. Why is it that these measures are not working for us? And I want to suggest to us maybe it is because we are looking in the wrong direction to control malaria in Kenya. You see, now we have somebody there fisting, and uh, you're wondering what does this person has to do with malaria control? Of course, this is the analogy. Uh, the individual is uh, evidently overweight, but he seems to be eating food rich in calorie and what we may generally call junk food. Now question, what is the likelihood of success if this person is daily going to the gym to lose weight, but is also having this kind of a diet to control his weight? Of course, that is what you will call zero work, right? Because while he is going to the gym to lose weight, he is not dealing with the cause of the problem. He is dealing with the effect, which is weight gain, but he is not addressing the cause of the problem. Is it possible that maybe malaria control is a problem because we are dealing with the treated nets and we are trying to look for new drugs because they are resistant? but we are not looking at the possible cause for this problem. And I want to argue that one of the causes of malaria problem in Sub-Saharan Africa is in the agricultural sector. Notice, for example, this publication that was published in 2019, it says evidence of insecticide resistance selection in wild mosquitoes due to agricultural pesticide use. In other words, the intensive use of pesticides in food production, those pesticides end up in water resources. These mosquitoes breed in water resources. They interact with these chemical ingredients in the water resources, and therefore they develop resistance. And so at the end of the day, when you use these insecticides to control the, the mosquitoes and malaria, it does not work. And so we are noticing that the agricultural sector is contributing a great deal in the, our inability to control malaria. 
Of course, this is not the only study. This one also indicates the contribution of agricultural insecticide use to the increasing insecticide resistance in African malaria vectors. Maybe all of this time we have been struggling to control malaria. And in fact, if you look at the GD in our GDP, the amount of money used in a given year to control malaria in the health sector, maybe that burden is coming from the agricultural sector. And so the health people are trying to solve a problem on their own, independent of other sectors who are contributing to that problem. And maybe we will become, we'll come closer to controlling malaria in Sub-Saharan Africa if we will control the problem from an agricultural standpoint. And if we can revisit our agricultural pro, pro, uh, practices, maybe we will be taking the first step in solving the problem in the health sector as far as malaria is concerned. So on this point, I will say, I will say combating insecticide resistance in malaria vectors while practicing pesticide intensive agriculture is akin or similar to ex exercising to lose weight while surviving on a junk food diet. Maybe we will never lose weight as far as malaria con uh, control is concerned, as long as our agriculture is pesticide dependent. Maybe it is time that we solve our agriculture and then we will be solving our health issues at the same time. Maybe it is time that the scientists in uh, vector biology and mosquito and related sciences and entomology, maybe it is time that they should look for the environmentalists and solve this problem uh, from a multidisciplinary uh, point of view. So in conclusion, in our story today, as far as pesticides in Africa and emerging uh, um, countries is concerned, we can borrow the words of Delton when he said, looking at our use of pesticide. He said, our generation has taken to the cosmetic use of pesticides. And I think perhaps unwittingly, not fully understanding the dangers it presents to ourselves and most importantly, to our children. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Victor, for that very, very insightful uh, presentation about uh, pesticides. So uh, to our audience, if you have any question that you would like to post to the presenter, you can uh, drop it in the chat box, then we'll try to go through each and every one. Or uh, you can raise up your hand if you want to maybe ask something, and then we will be able to move on together. So just uh, a quick uh, scan through the chat box. I see uh, quite a lot of uh, compliments from uh, Annette Busula. Hi, everyone. Dr. Busula, Annette of Kaimosi French University College. What an interesting topic. I look forward to this. Karibu sana. Uh, Muguro David, I am an organic farmer and environmentalist who advocates for the use of indigenous knowledge. Okay, uh, we have David Ndungu, greetings from Dar es, Dar es Salaam. Pleasure to join you, Karibu Sana. Uh, Fiona, thank you for an excellent talk. You have nice presentation. And also uh, another one from Annette, a great presentation. This is a comment. My interest is in vector control, malaria mosquito control. It is likely that use of some pesticides may lead to insecticide resistance due to infiltration of the pesticides from farms into mosquito level habitats through rains or watering of the crops. I think Dr. Victor, you expounded more on that. Thank you. 
As I've done in 2021 and published data from local farmers in Western Kenya showed that some farmers get pesticides such as DDT from neighboring countries for use on their crops. There is no completely, uh, there is need to completely ban such and act through policies between countries and local farmers uh, need financial support in accessing the right pesticides. They also need uh, good and updated training on use of pesticides. There is also need to once in a while monitor what pesticides are sold locally. Great, Arupi Mangat, please explain milk and bee issue. We didn't quite get that. Dr. Victor? Please explain. Please explain, I think, breast milk and bee issue. She didn't quite get that. <laughs> okay, uh, the issue is, uh, number one, these chemicals are chemical weapons. And as chemical weapons, they also come along with collateral damage. We have made that case. We get exposed to pesticides through food, and uh, of course, maybe if air, depending if we live from uh, areas where they practice pesticide intensive agriculture. So human beings uh, get exposed to these pesticides. And so we can detect the presence of pesticides in humans, for example, in human hair, in blood, for example. And what I presented is that uh, there are studies where they show the occurrence of pesticides like DDT specifically also in breast milk of lactating mothers. And so we are saying that by the time uh, DDT or other pesticides can be detected in breast milk of a lactating mother in concentrations that are even above acceptable limits, it tells you that the exposure to the mother is already high risk, that now the mother becomes a risk to the child as well. And so th these are uh, concerns that uh, should tell us that uh, the, the level of use of pesticides, the use and misuse of pesticides and the risk to the population is, some, is something that we need to look at more seriously. Uh, about the bees, the issue is the, in fact, today there is a concern that uh, the species of bees in the world have reduced almost by half. We are losing biodiversity. And one of the reasons is because the pesticides are toxic to the bees. And so they are part of the reason for the loss of biodiversity of different species of bees. And that is why, for example, in Germany and in some European countries, they have banned some of these pesticides because of uh, one of the reasons is that they are toxic to the bees and uh, of course, bees are very important uh, in the ecosystem. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that uh, insightful uh, response. And I also think uh, probably most of our audience will really also like to know more and more. And maybe it will be ideal, Dr. Victor, if you could maybe at the end of this, you can also share your contacts in uh, the chat box so that uh, they can reach out to you with a lot of ease. Uh, Everastas Obura, uh, quite a prompting presentation. Thank you. Uh, Lillian Kirwa, hello. Do we have examples of these chemicals? Do we have examples of these chemicals? The answer is yes. Um, I, um, we did a report to the PCPB when they invited the public uh, participation in terms of uh, the, the ingredients, chemical ingredients to be legislated for use in Kenya, which one should be banned. And we, we, we did a, a dossier that uh, lists all the chemical ingredients of interest, which ones we were suggesting to be banned with immediate effect. We had those that we recommended to be outfaced slowly. Uh, and then uh, we had those that we, we felt that, okay, maybe they, with the restricted use, uh, but they may be used uh, uh, as well. So that report 
that report is available online. Uh, maybe a, before we close this meeting, I can give a, a website link uh, where you can download the report. It indicates the, all the chemical ingredients by the PCPB. Alternatively, if you go to the PCPB website, it will give you all the list of chemical ingredients that have been allowed in Kenya uh, to be used uh, in the country. But in terms of the ingredients which we have priority of concern, we also have that report that we presented and petitioned uh, the PCPB to look at those chemicals. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, one from uh, Charity Nguyo. Hi, everyone. Very informative presentation. Thank you. Any current studies on presence of pesticides in honey? Uh, I haven't found any study in Kenya on the occurrence of pesticides in honey, which I think it is quite important study. I think uh, probably uh, people have not done that because uh, I know honey is uh, a very complicated matrix uh, in terms of analytical tools, but uh, studies are there from different countries on uh, the occurrence of pesticides in honey. Okay, thank you. Another one from uh, Rupi Mangat. On a scale of one to 10, how bad is the pesticide problem in Kenya? Uh, what is one and what is 10? <laughs> which one is good, extremely good? Which one is extremely bad? Rupi. <laughs> okay, let's say one is uh, we are doing extremely good and then 10 we say we are doing extremely bad eh? yeah uh i will put it at uh, eight for different reasons eight uh, for the reason that uh, one we have chemicals in our country which have been banned elsewhere and they are still being imported for me, that is a very serious concern. Uh, the second reason is uh, we have studies on the occurrence of pesticides in food uh, from different parts of Kenya, different classes of pesticides in different combinations. Of course, some of the concentrations may be below the allowable limit, but the fact that they occur and in different, uh, uh, different classes of pesticides that for me is a, is a concern. Number three, the fact that uh, we have a bill in parliament that had already been put in place petitioning the withdrawal of certain pesticides uh, from the market. And until today, uh, no action has really been taken, a positive action has been taken to that effect. To me, that uh, it, it paints negatively. Fourth, the fact that um, Tanzania uh, shows to be the worst in pollution uh, and we have nearly identical type of practices, uh, we cannot say that we are far much better from Tanzania. The fact that we do not have a lot of data, but the data from our neighboring countries show that things are not good. That data, in a sense, indirectly tells us that uh, in as much as we may not have all the data, things may not be as good as it seems. In other words, I'm saying absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. Thank you very much. Uh, from Lillian Kirwa, what do you think farmers should do now to cleanse their farms? Ooh, I think that is a broad question. It may need uh, experts from different fields, uh, uh, but uh, generally, generally, I think it is important that our farmers find information on alternative farming practices. Uh, uh, organic type of farming, they should uh, educate themselves about organic pesticides, vis-a-vis uh, -vis chemical pesticides. Uh, so I, I think, uh, there is a lot to be done. There is no one answer that may fit all farmers, so to speak. But I think our farmers 
also have a lot to do because they play a big role as far as human safety uh, in food production uh, is concerned. So there may, may not be one answer that may fit all, but I think our farmers also bear a great responsibility in the choice of farming practice that they use. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. I, okay, that's a moment. There's another uh, quick one here on breast milk contamination with pesticides. What is the magnitude of the problem? Uh, the fact that you can measure, you have pesticides in breast milk at measurable level. Uh, I think that is a great concern in itself uh, because it tells you that probably maybe the concentrations in the kidney might be higher than the concentration in the milk, for example. The impact on the kid, the child might be higher than the impact on the mother, for example. And so the fact that uh, we are having uh, a conversation around the occurrence of pesticides in uh, breast milk, uh, that itself, I think, should be worrying uh, by, the, by the time we get to, the, to such level. And so if, if we look at the data itself, uh, I, I don't have any data from Kenya, but we can have, for example, from Ethiopia, there's some data there where the concentrations are really alarming. Uh, I think uh, the fact that we do not have empirical data, that in itself should be worrying that maybe the situation might not be as good as we may think. So I think uh, it is something that if there are researchers here who are interested in such topics, uh, it is one of the areas that uh, should be looked at seriously. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, response. I think we have- Let me just say, yeah. um, if you Google, if you Google scientific report on pesticides in the Kenyan market, uh, that is the report we did and submitted uh, uh, that dossier to the Pest uh, Control Board, PCPB. It contains our thoughts on the different chemicals uh, that we we flagged out. So that is the title of the report, Scientific Report on Pesticides in the Kenyan Market. You can avail, it is available online. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for, for that. I think we have uh, exhausted all the questions, all the uh, comments that we had in the, in the chat box. Okay. I see two more have just come in, maybe just a quick one. Any alternative control methods for pests in place other than use of pesticides? This is from Esther Gondi. Yes, uh, not other than pesticides, but other than uh, chemical pesticides. Because uh, even if you use organic, they are pesticides. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, they are organic. Uh, they are organic uh, pesticides, and uh, if they are organic farmers here in the world, uh, in the in the audience, they can share uh, on the chat platform. Uh, or if they are business people here who, who are retailers on uh, such products, they can also share with us. But just to answer the question is yes, they are organic pesticides in the market as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another one from uh, Peter and Jeru. What can be done to ensure that farmers shift from use of pesticides to increase production where other indigenous solutions seems not to give high returns? Yeah, you see, there, there, there is a, a question or a debate. And the debate is, uh, if we go organic farming, will it not lead to food insecurity? And uh, the experts in that, which I am not an expert uh, in agronomics and the economics involved, but uh, there are evidences also to suggest that uh, that fear is not wholly true, that uh, organic farming is also sustainable in its own right. Uh, 
there are countries which are making policy that are uh, that are saying that uh, this percent of of um, land farm in the country will be put under organic farming and then this other percent will be put under uh, pesti uh, chemical pesticide uh, type of farming and so the advantage there is that the government those governments are recognizing the need to shift to organic farming and they are engraving it in the policy to show that there is a affirmative action to to have food produced uh, organically and so i think uh, if we consider all the dynamics that are uh, involved, I believe generally that it is possible that uh, we can shift organic to organic farming slowly but surely and uh, still uh, have food security. But uh, I will also say the experts in those particular areas are best suited also to, to, to give us uh, their thoughts. Thank you. Hello. 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 Go ahead, James. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shikuku, for the nice presentation and uh, enlightening us on this uh, side vis-a-vis -vis the emerging economies. My question would be. Uh, uh, some of the environmental institutions that we have in the country, specifically NEMA. So what role does NEMA play as far as uh, the talk is concerned, especially in the context of uh, environmental impact assessment? Because in your talk, of course, you know, there are those harmful pesticides that the health of human beings and of course the environment. So does NEMA, play any role in maybe regulating the usage of the pesticides? Okay. Uh, my understanding of uh, the legal framework, NEMA does not play a role in regulation of pesticide use. Uh, that is under PCPB. However, what NEMA does is it gives, stipulates uh, the the accept, acceptable limits of given concentration of given chemicals in, uh, say, drinking water. For example, if you want to bottle water for drinking, or maybe even if we are using uh, water from rivers and so forth, when we talk about the water quality, then the NEMA stipulates that water that is suitable for human consumption, then these particular pesticides, list of pesticides, the concentrations should not be above a given limit. So that is where I understand NEMA comes in. But in terms of regulation of the use and the misuse, importation and all that, then uh, PCPB uh, is the body that is taxed with that. The other question was about the cost. That uh, is organic farming, not expensive or organic pesticides in terms of mass production of pesticides. The way I look at it is that the cost of something should be evaluated from a life cycle assessment. By life cycle assessment, we mean from production to the death, in the quote, of a product that constitutes the life cycle of the product. And so when you talk about the pesticide, when you talk about the cost of the pesticide, you do not look at only the cost of production or the cost of purchasing, but you also have, for example, we have talked about the malaria burden in the country and the cost of managing malaria. That is a cost that comes also with the use of the pesticides. When you talk about the health impact of pesticides on the farmers uh, and uh, the people living around the farms, the sicknesses that they may have and the cost they use in treatment, all those are inbuilt 
in the course of assessment of a given product. And therefore, we should not look at the cost of a pesticide simply from how much you purchase it from a retailer, but we look at it from a life cycle assessment. That is when you can easily see that chemical pesticides in the long run, from my point of view, uh, will be costly vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, other alternative uh, options that may be available. Hey, thank you very much uh, for that. <clears throat> I see uh, Darcy Ogada have already shared uh, the link to the scientific report on the pesticides in the Kenyan market. Thank you very much, uh, Darcy, for that. You've uh, also tackled uh, the Rupi Mangat's uh, other question. And uh, one last one from Esther, Esther, Ong, uh, Esther Ngondi. What's the extent in Kenya? What's the extent in Kenya in the use of conservation biological control methods? I, I may not know. I may not know. At least I know that uh, there are those who are using biological control, uh, organic methods. But what I know is that they are the minority. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> We have gone through all the concerns and the questions that we had in the in the chat box, and uh, this actually brings us to the end of our today's uh, virtual talk. In fact, we are right in uh, good time. It's only two minutes away of our uh, set time of uh, half past three. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, each and every one of you, for joining us today for our virtual talk. It has indeed been uh, grateful having you on board. So maybe just uh, some uh, quick announcements to make before we officially close uh, is uh, to let you know that uh, our membership activities, uh, the Wednesday Bird Walks and the Sunday Bird Watch are still uh, on. On this uh, Sunday, on the 15th of uh, May, we are, our Sunday Bird Watch will be in Ololua Nature Trail at the Institute of Primate Research in Karen. And also next week on Wednesday, our bird work will be here at the Nairobi National Museum Grounds and Michuki Memorial Park. And to close the month on uh, 25th, uh, that will be on a Wednesday, we are at current Blixen Museum. Tomorrow is a uh, big day. It was on 14th May 2022. This is an opportunity for nature lovers, for all people around the world to go out and uh, appreciate their bird life where we go bird watching and submit our records to eBird. Actually, we will be eBird will be ranking countries depending on the species that uh, they. Uh, the report on that particular day. And we are really, uh, all systems go for Kenya to also be featured in that uh, global birding arena. So uh, from our desk here is to wish you a happy birding weekend. And thank you very much for joining us. Now we can live at our own pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.